friends, uh, for the rest of you uh, that are remaining here, please turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 35 to 42. So turn with me uh, to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 35 to 42. Reading from verse 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the 10th hour. Andrew Simon, Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is a Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon. Son of John, you will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. Uh, this is God's word for us this morning. Shall we pray together as we continue to hear for God's word this morning? Uh, let's pray together. Mm. Lord God, we thank you for gathering us here this morning. Lord, I don't know how the week looked like for everybody that's gathered here today and listening online. But Father, we pray now that you would just gather us. Lord, help us to focus on you and your words, and not only the words spoken, but through the ministry of this word, Lord, we ask that your spirit would also be present, and that you would meet with each and every one of us and speak into our hearts and move our lives in such way uh, as you desire and as you will. So Lord, we want to just acknowledge that you are Lord, that you're our God, and that we make ourselves available to you to do your bidding. So have your way with us, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm. Friends, have you uh, ever opened a fridge for an extended period and you just don't know why you opened the door or you don't know what you're looking for? You ever been there? And you've done that, and you just can't make up your mind what you want to eat. And uh, when you do it, it's okay. But boy, if you're a parent and your child is doing it, does that just drive you bonkers? <laughs> Close the door and look, <laughs> right? Just make up your mind before you open the fridge. And uh, if you know anything about me, Kathy will tell you I have a song for almost every occasion. You know, when something comes up, then I think of a song and maybe a song from Bono. You know, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Uh, it might be appropriate for that situation. Uh, I, I just don't know what I'm looking at. I haven't found it. And uh, sometimes maybe you're just hoping that somehow you'll come to some kind of enlightenment or revelation. Uh, oh, yeah, that's what I want to eat for the day. Right? And that, oh, I finally found it. Um. Maybe something like that, finding what you want to eat in the fridge, maybe for most of us, and the level of importance from 1 to 10, maybe it doesn't rank so high up there. But we're all searching, aren't we? Maybe some of you are looking for a place to rent. Uh, that's a little more important than just finding a meal, I think. Maybe some of you are looking for a fresh start in a new career, perhaps. Maybe some of you are looking for a job. Maybe some of you are looking for a boyfriend, a girlfriend, maybe a spouse, a mate. Uh, maybe that song, I still haven't found what I'm looking for, maybe reaches something much deeper. Maybe it's existential. Maybe we're searching for meaning, for purpose. And um, maybe we still haven't found what we are looking for. By the way, that song resonated because I think at the core of many people, they're not sure what they're looking for. 
And I think a lot of times we want to be told what we're looking for. Do you know that in 2022, approximately 12.29, so $12.3 billion were spent just on digital advertisement alone in Canada. Okay? That's about 68% uh, from according to Made in CA a website. Uh, but they say that's about, uh, if that's about 68.3, that means in year 2022, companies spent probably about $18 billion worth of advertisement in Canada. Uh, geeks like me who like numbers, that works out to be about $461.54 per person that companies spend money just advertising to get you to decide what you're looking for. Every year. The number is going up, and probably uh, the advertisement in that digital space is going up, up, and up, and up. Procter & Gamble, do you, do you know how much they spend every year in advertisement globally? Uh, take it with a grain of salt, but the figure I found is about $5 billion. That's a lot of shampoo bottles they need to sell before you know, they start making some money back. That's a lot of household cleaning products and all those things that they have to spend even before they start turning a profit. But if you don't know what you're looking for, I guarantee you someone will try to lead you down the path to influence you in what you're looking for. It's interesting that today when the disciples come and ask Jesus, uh, come to Jesus and they're looking at him, and I guess... Maybe they're a little bit in awe, they're following him, but they're a little bit shy to start the conversation. You ever been, I, I don't know, a little bit intimidated by somebody? Not really sure how to get the conversation going? Is that what's happened for the disciples? Was Jesus busy? Were they just looking for the right time? For some reason, they're following, but they're not asking any questions. So finally, Jesus turns around and asks them a question, what do you want? What do you want? It seems like such a simple question. And I guess you could answer, I, I just want a sandwich. I, I just want to hear a song. I, I, I just want the Blue Jays to win a little bit more. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I just want this or I just want that. But maybe the question Jesus might be asking might be much deeper, perhaps. Uh, and maybe the disciples, do they know what they really want? And maybe they stumble a little bit and they say, uh, Rabbi, which means teacher. But Rabbi, as a teacher, it, it doesn't capture the essence as much. By the way, John the Baptist is also later uh, uh, what is referred to as a rabbi. Rabbi means more like a master. You ever seen those old kung fu movie where some young kid who wants to become a kung fu, you know, ma you know, legend goes and finds a master and kneels before them and master, teach me, right? And Yes, my son, go and fill this wooden basket with water at the river and come back many a times. You know, you know, you've seen scenes like that, right? Uh, but when the Jewish people call somebody rabbi, they're saying, my great one, my guru, my teacher, someone who will teach me how to live life. Someone who they greatly respect. They, they want to learn how to live. They want to live like this master. They want to emulate. They want to copy uh, how they live. So they're addressing Jesus with great respect. And perhaps, maybe because John the Baptist has been referring to Jesus as, look, the Lamb of God. And if their master, their rabbi, John the Baptist, also is referring to Jesus as the Lamb of God with this, you know, kind of great respect, well, who is this man? And they're almost forced to address Jesus with that respect, even if they don't know too much about him, because the one that they respect is also respecting him. But to a simple question, what do you want? Rabbi, uh, uh, where are you staying? What's your postal code? 
What's your address? Is that what they really want? Oh, Jesus is staying at the Hyatt on Bay Street. Yay! I believe. Is that how we come to? Like, what's important about that? Maybe they don't know what they want. But at least asking and starting the question, Jesus, where are you staying? And Jesus has come. And you'll see. Come, and you'll see. What will they see? Will they see what they have been looking for? Will they find the answer to the song, I still haven't found what I'm looking for? I mean, during this time, the psyche of the nation was that if they weren't influenced by John the Baptist and his influence on them, they definitely would have been influenced by their culture. Israel was under the rule of Roman Empire, and they were hoping, and they are praying and wishing a Messiah, a Savior, someone that is like King David, a political Messiah, would come and save them from the Romans, and that God would place Israel as a superpower in the world like days of old, that they would be like the USA of today, of Great Britain's of days gone by, a Roman Empire, that, but it would fly David's star as the flag. Is that what they're looking for? If Canada dominated the Olympics in Paris, will our life change? Had Edmonton Oilers won the Stanley Cup, would I look better today? Probably. (laughs) But really, in the big scheme of things, it really doesn't mean that much. But maybe when Jesus has come, come and see. He's referring to maybe things much deeper. By the way, according to some statisticians uh, or some scholars, they, said, they say that Jesus asked 307 questions in the New Testament. Okay? Venture to guess how many pe- questions people asked of Jesus? According to that scholar, they say 183. So it's almost like for every two questions Jesus asked, I guess other people asked him another question. Some people, I think, has even put that 307 way up, that almost for every one question people asked of Jesus, that Jesus asked five questions. But surprisingly, to those questions that was asked, do you know how many times Jesus actually directly answers questions that are questioned to him? Zero. Zero. You're close. They say about three. I heard as high as five, I think. But that is a very small number. Why is that? You ever wonder why Jesus asked so many questions? Is it because he doesn't know? Is he just looking for some answers? Because that's a trick sometimes we use as pastors and teachers, right? When somebody asks you a good question, you have no idea the answer is, well, isn't that an interesting question? That's a great question. I'm so glad you asked that question. And underneath, you're like a little duck underwater, like, God, what do I say? What do I say? What do I say? What's the answer? What's the answer? Uh, And then like, well, what do you think? (laughs) What do you think? Is this what Jesus is doing? Probably not. Not like Jesus needs help. But maybe he's asking us those questions for our own sake. Maybe perhaps Jesus is not giving a pat answer because maybe our life with Jesus is not supposed to be so formulaic. We often like the pathway to God. It's easy as ABC. Acknowledge that Jesus is God. Believe in your heart right, Uh, that he's Savior and 
conf- and see, confess with your mouth that you're a sinner and died for you and you'll be saved. And, and I think if you really mean it, I think, and you cry out to God, God will save you. But was it really easy as ABC? To get to that place where you can confess with your mouth all those things, how many touches were required? How many moments? How many reflections? How many sermons? How many songs? How many phone calls? How many friends' shoulders and hands were needed before we came to that place of ABC? I think for most people, it's a journey. And I'm sure, certain none of those journeys look exactly alike. And that's the thing, isn't it? You get those books like what to expect in the first year of pregnancy. And it's great, but every time, you know, it's like 99% of the time, like it seems true, but that 1% when you really need help, it's like, it doesn't say anything about this, right? It's a general guideline. Often I feel like scripture, what does is God gives us the framework for all that we need. But different cultures, different time, we just need to put the flesh or put different clothing on it so that it's winsome and it's relatable to that generation and to that time and place. But the core stays the same. And so on that note, why does Jesus not give so many answers? So that God leaves some room for all of us to participate and leaves room for all original people. All of us are God's creation in this place and we're all human beings created in God's image. We're all saved through one Lord, Jesus Christ. We're all given only one spirit, the Holy Spirit. But we all look so different. Our shades and the colors of our skin all different, length of our hair, hairstyle, clothing, our last names, our experience, the place of birth, maybe your original language that you spoke. None of us are the same. Yet we all have a place in God's kingdom. Last week, I introduced you to some of the Christian apologists that are out there that has you know, garnered a lot of attention. Lee Strobel, you know, the case for Christ, uh, you know, he's become very famous, but he used to be an atheist, but he was a journalist. And and so his books go through like what a journalist does, and he takes a strong arguments for, against, and for, and lets you come to a conclusion, almost like a court case. Everything is possible, right? Everything is possible, but not, Right? Plausible, not likely. So, you know, you take the best argument and you come to a conclusion that what is the strongest point? What is the strongest case? And and also the Jim Wallace that introduced you, he used to be an atheist, but he's a detective working in cold case. So he looks at the scene of Jesus sort of death on the cross and what took place after, and he looks at it like a cold case. And he says it's very similar. Because a cold case is often when somebody's died, and sometimes the witnesses, you don't have access to them anymore. But taking all those things that are available and put all those facts into, you can infer from those things and come to a conclusion that all things are possible, but not all things are plausible. But by taking all those arguments and you know you build a case, you can come to some conclusions, if, even if you weren't there. So for those of you who like crime scenes, well, maybe someone like that would be a good person. Uh, these two people would be good people's books to read uh, to sort of strengthen your belief and you know work out some of the things maybe you, you've been thinking through. And, you know, there's people like Timothy Keller and other pastors who approach it from a maybe different angle, maybe reasons for God and so forth. But, you know, all these books, they talk about similar things, but it's addressing people from a little bit of a different angle. And so what 
you know, maybe for some of you, you really love Timothy Keller's stuff and maybe for others, well, it doesn't do it for me. And maybe some of you love the Lee Strobel stuff, but maybe it doesn't do it for you. It's just because we're all so uniquely different. And maybe that's why Jesus says, come and see. Come and see. You know, a little while back, somebody called and asked a lot about the church. And after exchange a few emails, do you know what my conclusion was? Jesus is always a good answer, by the way, at the church. (laughs) I did the Jesus thing, and I said, come and see. Come and see. Because how do you know this church is a good fit until you come and see? I mean, it's one thing to hear. Any of you ever gone on a blind date before? And you said, boy, sounded good on paper. Sounded good on paper. And if you're laughing, are you still friends with your friends who set you up? Sounded good on paper. Uh, But there's just no chemistry. And and sometimes you have to just see them in person. And maybe the questions that the disciples are asking or their search of what they're looking for, maybe it can only be answered by spending time. And not because what John told them to do. But Jesus said, come, come and see. Come and see. Friends, as you have answered uh, to the invitation of Christ for you to come and see and spend time, many of you have walked with Jesus for many years. What have you discovered? What is it about Christ? What is it about Jesus that you love the most? I'm so glad that Jesus is not like the socks they sell at Costco. You know what I'm talking about? Socks that says size for feet 7 to 14. (laughs) How can you have somebody wear the same socks that size 7 and 14? It's just not the same. What you need versus what you need might be different. What you are searching for, what you're looking for, what gives you the deepest purpose and meaning in your life might be different from you. God says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and with all your strength, meaning we are to love God with everything that we are. But are we the same? I know there's some people say, tell me how you feel. What did you think about that? How did that make you feel? Are you okay? And some of you are like, okay, that's enough, all right? <laughs> I, I'm fine, really, I'm fine, let's move on. You know, some people are really big on the emotion thing, and some people are maybe a little bit more cerebral. And we're all different. That doesn't mean if you're cerebral, you don't have a heart. Just maybe some are leaning a little bit more heavier on this side than some on this side. We're all different. Uh, And and by the way, the other day, one of the devotionals I was reading, it was so funny about a lady talking about a communal puzzle uh, table that they have at a nursing home. And um, have any of you ever done like puzzles that are like, you know, more than 15 pieces? (laughs) (laughs) 15 pieces, like, you don't need to give much thought to that. Pictures are so big, like, you know, anybody can do it. And that's why on the box it says for age, two to four, (laughs) okay? Uh, But when you start doing puzzles that are like 500 pieces, 1,000 or 2,000, and they're a little bit smaller, like they're not this big in piece, it's a different ballgame. You need a little bit of a strategy, right? So... Wait, wait, have any of you done like puzzles like that, over a thousand pieces? Yeah. The, well, what are some of the strategies you use? Hmm? Okay, you find the edges first. Okay, yeah. Uh huh. Col- okay, you differentiate by colors. What else? Hmm? But those are usually kind of go to places, right? Um, I heard one of the people there, they said they actually hide the edges first. 
and then do the stuff in the middle and put the edges later because they like that challenge. And I'm thinking, that's just, are they sick or something? Like, what's wrong with them, you know? You know, I, I like to find the corner pieces first, right? Because there's only four of them. And then find the edges and then, you know, and then you divide, separate things into colors and so forth. And, you know, you have pieces that go up, you have pieces that go indented. And, you know, you, you have a strategy in how you do it. But she found out that, boy, everybody does it different. Everybody does it different. And you would think that everybody would do it the right way, like how I do it uh, or how you do it. But even as puzzles, people do it so differently. Are we all same people? Do you wish Jesus said, here's the ABC of what you're looking for? Do you wish Jesus was more formulaic? I know that word formulaic is something that we don't often tag together with relationship. Imagine every morning your life together with your family is formulaic. You got the A's and the B's and the C's. Okay, got that check, check, check. Okay, see you later. Have a good day. Come back home. Check, check, check. Okay, good night. Could you imagine if your life was like that with people? It'd be so boring. And maybe that's why Jesus come. Come and see. So where do we go from here? This is where we go from here. You know what this is? Oh, very good. Oh, I'm glad you're with me today. Now this fishing box, it might look like just a small box. But look at this. There's three trays in there. They got little boxes in here. And, um, you know, uh, you know what these things are called? Yeah, that's why if you say a lure, yeah, everything is a lure. This is called a crankbait. And this is a floating, shallow diving crankbait. You know how the deep this goes when I'm reeling it in? Maybe about two, three feet max. Okay? So do you know where this is good to use? When the summertime comes, there's a lot of weeds growing, and you throw a lure, often what happens? It gets caught in the weed. But there's a lot of fish actually hiding in the weed, and they want to just catch a smaller fish by surprise, and then chomp. And then when they bite into this, they say, whoa, what kind of fish is that? That's pulling like I've never seen small fish pull, right? Uh, so that's a little crankbait. You know what this is? This is a little top water bait. It spins as it goes in that trail. I think it's supposed to just, you know, imitate maybe a frog on top water. So there's a top water lure, right? Um, you, you know what this is? This is called a Ned bait jig. And uh, when, you, when you put a plastic jig on it, they have plastic jigs that actually are buoyant, so they float. So when it goes to the bottom, it's standing up. So if you put a little plastic that imitates a crayfish and you're moving and the thing is standing up like this, or you put a minnow that's floating and it looks like a little bait fish, you know, pecking, eating at the food at the bottom, and the fish comes and bites it thinking it's a... And, and we don't have enough to time to go for all these things. But... You know, why do fishermen use all this? Because different fish want different things. Different fish are in different moods. Sometimes some fish, same fish, deep end, sometimes they're in shallow. Depending on the season, sometimes the weed lines are way out here onto the lake, sometimes it's not. Why am I telling you all this? What has this got to do with anything? Fact of the matter is there's no people alive. If I brought every single person up here today to tell a story, they would have a story to tell. This week was a really tough week in some ways. I felt like it was just emergency after emergency after emergency after emergency. And I'm not quite out of the woods yet, attending to this and that and that. And it's like, it's not the best timing, but when is it ever best timing? Sometimes you just have weeks like that. What do you want? If you ask me this week, 
It's a little different from what I wanted last week or the week before. What do you want? What are you looking for? As you open the door, not into a fridge, but into life, maybe a door up to heaven, what are you praying for? What do you want? And Jesus invites you, don't be in a rush. Come and see. We're told it's about the 10th hour, so that's probably about 4 p.m. in the afternoon. And some of the biblical scholars said that they probably spent the night together with Christ. That once that day got going, once they started to discover about Jesus, it just went on and on. Maybe they even spoke through the night and maybe Jesus got very little sleep that evening because of them. By the time they woke up next morning, we're told at least out of the two, one of them was Andrew, Simon's brother. And as he couldn't wait until to run to his brother to tell him, I think we found the Messiah. I think we found him. He was so excited about that. Friends, is it possible that in God's gospel ministry, that each and every one of you are like these different lures, right? A little jig with an underspin and a pretty little tail. Or maybe another crankbait that dives a little bit deeper. All different shapes and sizes. But God, knowing that different people need different things in life, that God uses each and every one of us in our stories, our personality, our uniqueness to draw people in to God's kingdom. Not only are we invited to come and see, that perhaps God's inviting you and me like a little letter to the world, personally to each individual to say, come and see. And that through your life, my life, through the scriptures, through the ministries of the church, and through relationships that people might discover a little bit more. That one touch here, a one meeting here, a one comment here, one idea here, that God uses all these things to bring somebody into God's kingdom. And it's not programmed. It's not so formulaic, but God acknowledges the beauty and the individuality and the uniqueness and the value of each and every one of us that are created in God's creative diversity, and, 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 but in unity and all that beauty that exists. And he wants to use us as individual stories, custom made, for each individual that you will reach out to. You know, Jackie Robinson was the first black uh, person to play major league baseball. Uh, breaking a baseball color barrier, uh, he faced jeering crowds in every stadium. It was a different time. And uh, while playing one day in his home stadium in Brooklyn, he committed an error. Any of you have ever played baseball? A lot of times when you're playing baseball, you're waiting. But you're ready. And you have these imaginary plays. If it goes this way, I could jump and dive and catch that ball. Or, you know, I got to put my foot together like this so nothing goes through between my legs. And you have all these scenarios in mind, but you, you're ready for it. And even though you play together as a team, when you need to make a play, it comes down to you. No, no one can help you to stop that ball in that moment. So you're alone. And for those of you who ever played baseball on a team, sometimes it's a lot of pressure, especially when it gets into the late innings and that play can determine whether you make it into playoffs or winning the playoffs. So at a professional level, when he made that error, and he already knew so many people were against him, he felt humiliated, and uh, 
He didn't know what to do. And the jeering just got louder. But then his shortstop, Pee Wee Reese, came over. His teammate stood next to him, put his arms around him, and they looked at the fans and at the stand together until the jeering died down. Robinson later said that Pee Wee's arms around his shoulder that they saved his career. You think Pee Wee ever thought that he was saving his career? No, we we're just told that's the decent thing to do. That's what you do for your teammate. But perhaps God making us uniquely as we are. Maybe he's calling us to just go to somebody, to stand next to them, put your arms around them. Because you too know what it's like to make an error. But you also know what it's like to be in the presence of the Lord even after you had made an error. Let us pray. Lord God, what are we looking for today? Lord, we might not have all the answers, but our deepest desire is to also to be with you to be with you, Lord, and to see you. And Lord, even if we might not have all the answers, we know that you do. And Lord, it's amazing that as limited as we are, our experiences, our stories, and our witness and our testimony, and the spent time that we've spent with you can also have value and that it can be meaningful to somebody else as well. So Lord, just as you have come, left the comforts of your home up above to come and adorn the body of a feeble baby and have given yourself to us, I pray for those of us who have also eaten and drank deeply from your spirit that we would also be able to go forth and to invite others to come and see a hungry person telling another hungry person where we found food, a thirsty person telling another person where we found drink. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.